Hello followers, it is 22 here. If you enjoy this story and would like to see more from this author, feel free to take a look at their collection of short stories now available on Amazon. Link in the description. It all started with a whisper. I was nearing the end of a recurring dream. One in which I was late for class and could not remember my locker combination, a predicament not apparently shared by any of my nearby classmates. I had this dream frequently. If I were to rank my nocturnal reruns, among the greatest hits would be this one. The one where it's finals week and I realize with horror that I hadn't attended a single class all semester, and the one where two or more of my teeth randomly begin falling out. Jenna, bless her, claims to never dream. Or, if she does, she doesn't remember any of them. I envy her that. The dream always ends with me, alone in the hallway, as the other students had successfully departed with their armloads of textbooks. Struggling at the combination lock, the next period bell screaming overhead. Only this time, the dream ended differently. Someone stepped up behind me, so quietly that I did not know that they were there until they whispered in my ear. Their breath was not warm on my neck, but icy cold, and their voice was in a strange, sexless register, too high for men, but too low for a woman. And this voice whispered a single word, a name. Nancy. I sat up in bed. Though the voice had spoken softly, I could almost hear it echoing through the bedroom, remnants of it clinging to the walls like cobwebs of sound, and I wondered if, in fact, I had dreamt what I had heard, or if it had been spoken in the waking world, rousing me from sleep. But the room was still and dark, and empty of anything or anyone unusual. I glanced over at Jenna, but she was sound asleep her breathing deep and steady. It happened again the next night. My fingers were frantically turning the dial on the unresponsive combination lock as the school bell screamed accusatory overhead. This time, just as the voice spoke into my ear, I felt the pressure of a single finger on my upper back, poking the muscle with uncomfortable force, causing pain, the coldness of the digit just as frigid as the voice itself as it whispered. That's it. I once again shot up in bed, wide-eyed, a small groan falling lamely in my mouth as I did so. I squeezed my eyes shut and shook my head, shedding the dream. Jenna stirred. Are you okay? She inquired from the darkness. I sucked in a deep breath. I think so, I responded as I exhaled. She placed a hand on my back and immediately withdrew it. My skin was covered with an icy sweat. You're soaking wet, she said. Bad dream, I said, and I fell back onto my pillow. The clock beside me glowed at 3.13, I was still awake when my cell phone alarm chimed at 6.15. When I stepped out of the shower that morning, Jenna was sitting on the closed toilet lazily brushing her teeth, her blonde hair stringy and falling over her eyes. Foamy toothpaste threatens to drip from her bottom lip. She gave me a tired, adorable smile that I returned wanly, grabbing my towel from the rack. Rough night? She mumbled over her mouth full of paste and brush. You could say that. I walked over to the sink and used my towel to wipe steam from the mirror before wrapping it around my waist. My reflection showed me a mask of exhaustion, heavy bags under my eyes, my eyelids drooping with sleepiness. I looked terrible. Jenna joined me, her step springy and held back her messy hair in one fist as she bent over to spit into the sink. Hey, how'd you do that? She asked my reflection as she stood up again. Do what? 
She pointed at my back with a look of concern. I pivoted my right shoulder forward until I could see a small portion of my upper back in the mirror. There was a deep blue, penny-sized bruise there, round, surrounded by a halo of greenish-yellow. My mouth fell open slightly, and I furrowed my brow. It looks painful, she said. How'd you do it? I have no idea, I asked. Jenna poked it. Ow! I protested. When I saw her playful grin, I couldn't help but smile in return. I moved as if to grab her as she ran quickly from the bathroom, giggling. As soon as she was gone, my smile disappeared, too. There was no dream on the third night. I realized this when my alarm woke me up from a deep sleep at 6.15am. I silenced it immediately and looked over at Jenna. She turned away from me, placing one pillow over her head to block the morning light, slowly infiltrating the room. I stood and stretched, still sleepy but feeling rested, stepping into the bathroom as quietly as I could, turning the knob so that the door would shut silently. I dropped my boxers on the floor and walked into the shower, shivering under the blast of cold water, allowing it to wake me up as I waited for it to warm. By the time I was done, the water was piping hot, and there was a thick fog of steam filling the room. I grabbed my towel from the rack, dried off, and stepped toward the sink. There, on the mirror, written in the moisture, was the word, Nancy. My wet skin broke out into goosebumps. I stared at the name dumbly for several seconds. Eyes still on the mirror, I sidestepped to the bathroom door and opened it gently. Jenna remained asleep, or it was at least pretending to be, in a mobile lump in the near darkness. The easiest explanation was that she had written it in the mirror while I showered, a playful morning prank. But then I remembered I had never told her the details of the previous two nights' dreams. She had no reason to know that name. I closed the door again. After another moment's pause, my tired mind still trying to piece together an explanation, I took off my towel and began to wipe the name away. And in the mirror's reflection, like something out of a cliched horror movie, I saw someone standing behind me. Someone smaller and more slender than me. Someone with jet black hair, pale skin, and black circles around eyes the color of ice, lips upturned in a malevolent, jeering grin. I let out a low bellow and spun around on my bare heels, my foot slipped on the wet floor and I fell straight down, my back raking harshly against the edge of the sink as I made my rapid descent. My tailbone hit the tile with a thud and I winced, hissing in breath. When I looked up from my pathetic position, naked on the wet bathroom floor, my body throbbing in about four different places, each one vying for attention, I saw that no one was there. Soft footsteps rapidly approached the bathroom, and Jenna burst in, looking first with panic across the room before lowering her eyes and finding me. Are you okay? she asked, crouching down and placing one warm, concerned hand on my shoulder. I sat forward, grabbing my towel to cover myself. Yeah, I responded, groaning out a lie. The floor was wet and slippery. There was no dream on the fourth night. I woke on my own and stretched under the covers, my feet searching for cool spots under the sheets. As I stretched, I felt aching in my back and tailbone, reminders of the episode in the bathroom the morning before. I turned my head and looked at the clock on the nightstand. 7.45. I overslept. I sat up quickly, grabbing my cell phone from the nightstand, turning it upright, silently cursing the blasted thing for not waking me up. And there, 
perfectly centered in the dead, black screen was a hole. A hole that punched all the way through the device, surrounded by splintering fingers. A web of cracks extending to every edge of the screen. Jenna rolled over to face me, and then, seeing the shattered cell phone in my hand, sat up, swiping her hair from her eyes. What happened? she asked. I don't know, I answered, fruitlessly pressing the power button on the phone, already knowing it wouldn't turn on. Did you step on it or something? she asked. I don't know, I repeated, a note of irritation in my voice. I realized I would rather be irritated at this moment than terrified, so I pivoted my emotions in that direction. You don't know? She asked, skeptical. I tossed the dead cell onto the covers and slipped out of bed. Jenna picked it up and began mashing the power button. I walked into the bathroom and shut the door. Ryan? She called after me, concerned. I'm late for work. I yelled through the door. I got to my office more than an hour late, and only twenty minutes before a scheduled presentation with senior staff. Tori, my assistant, appeared at my office door no sooner than I had dropped my briefcase on my desk with a frustrated sigh. Is everything all right? She asked a mask of worry on a face framed by unnaturally red and curly hair. I couldn't tell if she was more worried about why I was late, and I was never, ever late, or the fact that I was due to deliver a very important presentation within the hour with no time for our routine pre-game run-through. I didn't mind giving presentations as long as I was both prepared and rehearsed, and at the moment I was barely one of those things. Cell phone's dead, I said, so I overslept. Do you make copies? I made them yesterday, she said, in a tone that almost communicated the fact that I already knew this. Folders are on the table in the conference room. Projector's on, file loaded. Projector is on, files loaded. Coffee? Please, I said, turning on my computer. Tori disappeared. I loaded my question and skimmed through it, reminding myself of the key points, my lips moving as I quickly read each one under my breath. My heart was pounding, but it wasn't because I had just run up the stairs. Twenty-five people crammed into the conference room. Senior staff took the ten seats at the table. Everyone else was standing at the perimeter. When the door was closed, I stood at one end of the table, temporarily blinded as my head intercepted the projector's light. I gave a smile that I hoped looked more self-deprecating than nervous and smoothed out my tie as I stepped aside. Good morning, everyone, I said through a mouthful of cotton balls. I apologize if I appear a tad frazzled this morning. A technology failed me. In spite of the morning's events and my frayed nerves, about three minutes into the pitch, I had found my groove. It turned out I had rehearsed enough in the previous days that I was able to kick it into autopilot without even realizing it had happened. And as I found myself calming, I could also feel the room calming along with me. Most of those present, if not everyone, nodded at the salient points and chuckled at the humorous ones. Despite the morning's unfortunate beginnings, I was winning the day. But it all fell apart quickly, and with a strange sense of inevitability. If you look at this chart from last year, I said, using a laser pointer to shine a spot of red on a colorful pie chart projected on the screen, you will see that... Nancy... The voice came from the other side of the room. It was high and light as a feather, and also eerily dry as if it didn't belong in the room itself. There was no hint of any reverberation, as if instead of bouncing off the walls or furniture, the sound was simply passing right through them. I stopped talking and turned around. Two dozen faces stared back at me. 
some of them sporting brows furrowed with confusion or concern, most of them blank, a couple etched with boredom. I cleared my throat. The hand with the pointer hovered pointlessly in the air, the red dot now shining randomly on a poster on the wall. Uh, teamwork uh, makes it all work. After an uncomfortable pause, I turned back to the screen and re-aimed the pointer at the pie chart, which took some effort as my hand had begun to tremble awkwardly. I cleared my throat again, though the dryness would not budge. Uh, as I was saying, I croaked. You will see that... Nancy. The voice was sing-songy and carried the hint of a barely concealed laugh. I turned around again quickly to scan the room, inadvertently taking a step once again into the projector's light. I blinked and immediately sidestepped, a grin of uncomfortable embarrassment on my face as dots of light poked at my vision. Faces stared back at me in silence. Confused faces. Blank faces. Bored faces. Irritated faces. Tori's face. Concerned. And one face, all the way in the corner, smiling. A pale, white face, with icy blue eyes, surrounded by rings of black. Its grinning mouth opened. Nancy. Heart in my throat, I looked around at everyone else. Do you not hear this? Do you not see this person? But no one was looking around. No one acknowledged the sound. All eyes were locked on me. My tie suddenly felt very tight, and my tongue was like a dry rug. With a nervous chuckle, I picked up a cup of water from the table. I sipped it, my hand shaking, and forced down a swallow. I, uh, my apologies, everyone, I said. Uh, not having a great morning. Uh, bear with me. I took a bigger swig of water, throwing my head back, and when I looked across the room again, the figure in the corner was gone. I took a deep, steady breath. Okay, I said, putting all my effort into a smile. The corners of my mouth weighed a ton. How about everyone open up your folders and turn to page three? I set the cup down. The sound of folders sliding and pages rattling filled the room. I took another unsteady breath, heart pounding, and attempted to calm down. I locked eyes with Tori and raised my eyebrows. A look of camaraderie and desperation. She raised hers in return, her face a question mark. I continued. On page three, you'll see. Who's Nancy? Someone asked. My heart stopped. I, I, I'm sorry? Who's Nancy? The voice repeated, and several people began to chuckle quietly. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't. I began. Bob Foster, CEO. My boss's boss's boss slapped his folder shut and slid it towards me with force. He was clearly not amused. I stopped the folder before it went over the cliff and threw him a look that I hoped was both grateful and apologetic. I flipped the folder open. As the chuckling continued, I silently read. Nancy, prepared and presented by Nancy Nancy. Nancy 23, 2022. Nancy Nancy Nancy. I was back at my desk, my head in my hands. I promise those pages weren't like that when I put the folder together yesterday. Tori was pleading. She stood before my desk, her hands in a knot in front of her chest, her red hair and stick-thin body making her look like a nervous matchstick. For the fourth time, Tori, I believe you, I said, lifting my head to make eye contact with her. Someone is messing with me. Who is? I wish I knew. 
Mr. Foster is livid. So is Walt. No doubt, I responded, returning my head to my hands. Can I get you anything? A pistol? Some cyanide? That's not funny, Tori scolded. Nothing is, I said, and she walked away with a sigh. I sat in silence. Nancy, a voice shouted, and I jumped. Jared stood in the doorway, a huge, conspiratorial smile on his face. He knocked, shaving a haircut on the doorframe, even though I was already quite aware of his presence. I heard he dropped a massive boner in front of Forrester this morning, he said, walking in. He dropped gracelessly into a chair in front of my desk. What do you want, Jared? I asked, massaging my temples. He chuckled and shook his head. I just wish I'd been there to see it. I'm sure the version being circulated by everyone in the office is far more colorful and interesting than the real thing. He sat forward, suddenly, and slapped my desk with both palms, startling me for the second time. I'm pretty sure his blood was laced with caffeine. You know what you need, old man? I'm 38, I said. You're 31. I'm not... Do you know what every old man needs? He said, his grin broadening widely. Although he was presently annoying me, he was also the closest friend I had in the office. And, amazingly, I found myself smiling in return. What? I asked. What does every old man need? Jared stood up, practically bouncing on his heels and pantomiming a swinging gesture. No, I said, dropping my smile. Jared, still bouncing, nodded, his eyes wide, his grin wider, and made a backhanded, swinging gesture. I said no. Racquetball, he said, only he intentionally mispronounced it, racquetball. I turned away from him and faced my computer screen. No, I said. I'm working late. They're giving me a second chance at the presentation tomorrow. Jared backed slowly towards the door, continuing to swing his invisible racket. Working late's fine, he said. I couldn't get to the court at Lou's until eight anyway. It'll do you some good. I'll work off some of those nerves. See you later, old man. He laughed. I considered it. I worked until 7.30, stopping at the mall for a new cell phone, swapping the SIM card. Text Jenna, who already knew I was working late, to tell her I was meeting Jared at Lou's for a racquetball. Don't let him wear you out, she texted back. You're not as young as you used to be. Thanks for that, I said out loud, but did not text in return. Lou's was the last independently owned gym in the city. It was ancient, and much of the equipment was outdated, but it had an old-school atmosphere and charm that no chain could ever match, and a congeniality among the clientele that could never be replaced. And the glue was Lou, a retired Navy SEAL who was probably in his mid-seventies, uh, tough as nails and armored with old muscle. He was a man who liked to bark insults with thinly veiled good nature at the sweaty masses. Rumor had it that he had made more than one musclehead cry with just a few sharp but hilarious verbal missiles. He never smiled, even when he laughed. When Jared and I walked in at eight o'clock, having first met up in the parking lot, the gym crowd was already thinning out. There were just a couple of people on treadmills and one guy at the weights. Lou barely looked up at us from his newspaper as we walked in. We have the racquetball court at eight o'clock, I said as we walked by. Like I care, Lou grunted. Always a pleasure, Lou, Jared said with a smile. You have an hour, Lou shouted at us as we entered the locker room tipping his head back towards a large clock on the wall. Close at nine, sharp. 
We'll be done no later than 9.15, Jared shouted back. Be a miracle if the old man lasts the hour, Lou called back. Jared laughed. I shook my head. Lou was wrong. I actually barely lasted 45 minutes. Jared mopped the floor with me, figuratively speaking, and when we were finished, I collapsed on the floor, gasping for breath, every inch of my clothes soaked through with sweat. I feel like a used rag, I thought, and probably looked like one too. Jared bent over, hands on his knees, barely winded and barely sweating. He had a gleeful smile on his face, and looked as if he was preparing a verbal barb, but then thought better of it, and said, Good game. What is? I asked. I can't remember. He helped me to my feet, and we shambled toward the locker room. We didn't exchange words. I was mostly incapable of speech. The rest of the gym was empty, as was the front desk. Lou must have been in his office. Some of the lights were already turned off. As we both spun the dials on our combination locks, I had a flashback to my dream from four nights prior. But, of course, I remembered the numbers, and the door swung open with a loud and annoying creak. Jared began stuffing his work clothes into his gym bag, then looked over to me. I was still catching my breath, my wet clothes hanging from me like sagging skin. I gotta shower first, I said, shaking my head with exhaustion. I can't drive home in this, and I'm too sweaty to change. Got it, he said, slamming his locker door. Good game. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I nodded, slumping down on a bench as he left the room. I heard him shout a farewell to Lou, which was answered by a grunt. There was a stack of white towels on a deep shelf near the end of the row of lockers. I stripped and threw my wet clothes on the floor of my locker, which I closed and locked, grabbing a towel and sauntered over to the showers, my bare feet sticking to the concrete as I walked. I hung the towel on a hook outside the showers and stepped in. There was a long row of shower heads along the wall with no partitions for privacy. Navy style. Lou would have it no other way. The water never got above lukewarm. At first, it cooled my hot skin, but after a few minutes, I began to shiver. The water was also so hard that I could barely make a lather with the soap from the wall dispenser. As I was rinsing the last remnants of the thin layer of soap from my face, I heard a noise and distant creaking. Metallic, like the sound of a locker door opening. I turned off the shower head and wiped water from my eyes and my fingertips. Hello? I called out. Lou? A locker door then slammed shut loudly, and my heart skipped a beat. I stepped toward the door of the shower room. One foot slipped on soap scum, and I jerked, awakening the soreness in my back. I groaned softly and placed a hand on my low back, massaging it as I stepped more carefully. Reaching around the corner for my towel, I found nothing there. I looked. The hook was empty. Lou? I called out again. My voice bounced back from the concrete walls and the metal lockers, and was then swallowed instantly in silence. My body broke out in goose flesh, my wet skin chilled by the air. I had a realization. Jared? I called out. This isn't funny, man. Silence. I moved toward the lockers, dripping, wet feet clapped on the floor as I walked. The light seemed dimmer, and I wondered if Lou had shut some of them off, a way of giving me the hints that he wanted to close up for the day, but I was making him wait. I looked toward the locker I had chosen, expecting my combination lock to be gone or opened, but it was still there, hanging dutifully in its place. I spun the dial, unlocked the lock, and opened the door with a loud creak.
The locker was empty. No, not quite empty. On the high shelf just above eye level were my keys, wallet, and cell phone. But everything else, my clothes, shoes, and gym bag, were gone. I furrowed my brow in confusion, a nervous feeling creeping its way up into my chest. Lou? Jared? I called out. The room responded with their names only, and then it was quiet. I grabbed my things from the shelf and then padded over to the end of the row of lockers where the shelf of towels was located. It was empty. I rolled my eyes. Come on, guys. I yelled. Not funny. In response, all the lights turned off. The only light was a dim glow coming in around the edges of the locker room door. Lights that was escaping from the main workout room on the other side. I walked carefully toward that dim light, occasionally losing it as my eyes had not yet adjusted to the darkness. I stepped carefully, afraid of hitting my toes on a bench or the corner of a locker. The distance seemed endless. My breathing was loud in my ears and shaky, and not only because I was cold. When I was about halfway to escape, I heard a whisper. Nancy. It said. I felt the breath of it on my wet neck, impossibly cold, sending rapid shivers down my arms and both legs. I took off in the darkness towards that dimly lit rectangle, my feet slapping loudly as I went, the sound echoing throughout the dark locker room, and over that sound I could faintly hear quiet laughter. I slammed through the door and into the gym, panting. The locker door closed silently behind me, and I stood there, panting, expecting it to open again, expecting someone to come out behind me. I heard laughter. There was Lou, behind the desk, sizing me up as I stood there, wet and completely naked, vainly attempting to cover myself with hands that still clutched my phone, keys, and wallet. I drove home wearing a dark blue sweatshirt with cut-off sleeves, tattered gray shorts, and a pair of worn-out tennis shoes that were two sizes too small. The best outfit that Lou could throw together from the gym's lost and found. I smelled like someone else's old sweat and cigarettes and had to roll the window down. Did Jared come back while I was in the locker room? I had asked him. No, he said. Did anyone else come in? I asked. No, he said. It did. I hesitated. Did you take my clothes while I was showering? Lou looked at me sternly, and I immediately wished I could retract the question, like a fisherman pulling in a fresh catch, and I dropped my gaze. He didn't bother to respond. Sorry, I said. I'm just trying to figure out what happened. He had relented with a rattling sigh. Someone might have come in when I was in the office. Seems to me someone just wanted to play a joke on you. No harm, no foul. No harm, no foul, I said, although I didn't actually agree. But how did they know my locker combination? Lou fixed me with a steely look. Gym closed 15 minutes ago, he said. I got to work early the next day, allowing myself ample time to rehearse my presentation again. Once Tori arrived, I would run through it a second time with her, and then I would be fully prepared for the meeting at ten o'clock. I was being given a rare second chance. It wouldn't be good enough for me to not blow it this time. It had to be flawless. No one else was there. I turned on all the overhead lights until every early morning shadow was chased away. I left my office door open, humming quietly to myself. I jerked at every distant noise. 
As Jenna had kissed me goodbye this morning, she wished me luck and handed me a brown bag. Breakfast for the All-Star, she had said with a smile. I booted up my computer and dumped the contents of the bag on my desk. A red apple threatened to roll off the desk. I caught it and set it upright. There was also a bottle of water and something wrapped in foil, a bagel with cream cheese from the shape of it. I sat down and unwrapped it without looking, my eyes fixed on my computer screen. I picked up the bagel and brought it up to my mouth, my eyes scanning the text of an email. The smell hit me just before the bread touched my lips, and I stood up quickly, tossing the bagel to my desk. The backs of my knees struck my chair, and it rolled away. There, between the two halves of the bagel and two thick layers of cream cheese, was a dead frog, reeking of formaldehyde. Its back feet protruded from one end, its arms from the sides, and most of its head from the other end. It was wearing a bagel costume. I stared at it, my stomach lurching. There was a soft knock at my office door, and I started. It was Tori. She stared at me silently, her look pitying. She didn't look at my desk, didn't see the dead frog masquerading as a bagel that had nearly been my breakfast. You're in early, I said to her, attempting to compose myself. Have you checked your email yet? She asked, eyebrows screwed up in concern. I was just getting ready to, I said. I grabbed the paper bag, slapped it over the frog bagel, picked it up, and threw everything in the trash. Why? There's an email from Walt. Mr. Forrester had cancelled the meeting. He said they want to take things in a different direction. I was in the office bathroom, alone, pacing. I was furious. I was disappointed. I was frustrated, and I felt undermined. I ran my fingers through my hair. I put my hands on both sides of a sink and looked in the mirror, studying my pathetic reflection. I wallowed in self-pity, and for a moment, I felt like I was going to cry, actually burst into tears, and I shook my head rapidly, denying myself the emotion. I jerked away from the sink and paced towards an open stall, not intending to enter it, just moving around trying to shed the negative energy and anger that was coursing through my body. My shoes clicked loudly on the tile with each step. I stopped in front of the stall doors and sighed, my shoulders and head dropping, defeated. From behind me, a whisper. And see. Softly spoken, almost sung, and carried on a breeze of quiet laughter. I spun around, furious, and for the briefest of moments, I saw its face. That very pale and jeering face. But then my stomach caved in painfully, and I was kicked hard in the gut. The force of the blow was strong enough to send me tumbling backwards. My back slammed against the stall door, which smacked against the side wall, and I fell my upper back colliding painfully with the edge of the toilet. My teeth clacked together, and I bit my lip. I slid to the floor, eyes shut in pain. I turned to put my palms on the linoleum, but before I could push myself up, a cold hand gripped the back of my head and slammed my forehead against the rim of the toilet. Bright lights flashed in my vision. Then I felt myself being lifted. Impossibly strong hands had gripped me by the back of my shirt, and I was being lifted until my face hovered above the bowl. I smelled the chemicals in the water, and mumbled a feeble, No. The hand returns to the back of my head. I could feel its coldness through my hands, fingers gripping my hair, pulling it into a fist. And then my head was shoved down, splashing into the water. My chest was pressed hard into the rim of the bowl, and I was forced to exhale, bubbles sliding past my submerged cheeks and ears. I reflexively inhaled, and water filled my lungs, burning them. I choked and convulsed against the hands that held me there, 
A knee pressed into my spine. I opened my eyes and saw nothing but blurred white porcelain, the periphery of my vision turning black as my thoughts began to swim. I struggled, my energy waning, feeling consciousness fade even as my panic dully increased. Every fiber in my being wanted to cough, wanted to expel the water that was invading my lungs. But I forced myself to deny the reflex. The hands that held me down were incredibly strong. Inescapable. I am going to drown, I thought, with a sudden and eerie calmness. I'm going to die in a toilet. And then, suddenly, the weight of my back eased. Not completely, but a little. And there was a loud roar all around me, vaguely familiar. I recognized it. The toilet was being flushed. As the bowl emptied, I gasped in air, hungry for it, and coughed violently. No longer held down, I placed my hands on the rim of the bowl and pushed myself out. I turned and sat on the floor, letting my back rest against the toilet, coughing repeatedly and then spitting on the floor. Both it and my clothes were wet. My hair clung to my face and dripped. I sat there, panting, all energy drained from my body, and looked through the stall door. No one was there. The next day was Saturday. I woke up on my own from a dreamless sleep. My cell phone read 7.30. Jenna slept in beside me. I needed to clear my head, be alone with my thoughts, consider how best to deal with this person, this ghost, this poltergeist, this whatever it was that had made the previous week a living hell for me. I slipped on a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and my running shoes, and drove to a park only two miles away from the house. There, a running trail surrounded a small playground, and the entire park was framed by overhanging trees that provided a pleasant shade. This early on a Saturday morning, it was deserted. I began to run. Where do I start? With Jenna. Tell her everything that has happened. She knows that this week has been a bad one, but I have spared her most of the details, especially the ones that are too fantastical to explain. It would feel good to tell someone, especially someone who loves me and is concerned about me, but she won't know any better than I do how to deal with it, assuming, of course, that she believes me. Who, then? The police? No. A priest? Maybe. But would anyone actually believe me? Does this sort of thing actually happen to people? Do I believe it myself? I had made two laps around the park. A light sweat coated my skin, and the morning air was cold against it. One lap was half a mile. On a good day, I could make ten laps. But today, my chest was burning. I stopped to cough, my lungs rattling with water, the remnants of yesterday's bathroom incident. I bent over and placed my hands on my knees, continuing to cough. Each cough prompted another, more painful one. Birds flew out of the nearby trees, scalding me for the noise I was making. There was no other sound to be heard, except for the very quiet rustling of leaves. My cell phone buzzed in my pocket. I stood up, making every effort to stifle any further coughing, my lungs fiery. I fished the phone out of a deep pocket of my baggy running shorts and began to walk slowly as I turned it on. I had a new message from Jenna. It read, Who is Nancy? I stopped walking and stared silently at the screen. And then, as if on cue, a voice from behind me. Nancy. I spun around, seeing nothing but empty trail. A line of tall trees to the right, freshly cut grass and a playground to the left. Nancy. I began slowly walking backwards, in the direction of the park entrance. My eyes scanned left to right. Where was the voice coming from? There was no one. 
But then, I saw it. The figure, half hidden behind the trunk of a tree about twenty feet away. Jet black hair, white face, icy blue eyes, staring into my own. Wide, sneering grin. One white hand with the black nails gripped the bark. And see. I turned and ran. Hopelessness gripped me as I remembered that I was already winded. I could barely run. My lungs buzzed with pain as I gulped for breath, and as I ran, I could hear a second set of footsteps running behind me, scuffing the fine gravel of the trail, getting rapidly closer. I glanced backward and saw that face, grinning madly as it threatens to overtake me. A lightning bolt of terror traveled down my spine. If I could just get to my car... I was shoved sideways so forcibly that my feet left the ground, and I fell. There was no stopping the momentum. I collapsed to the side of the trail, and my cheek met the protruding root of a branch, splitting the skin there, a stinging sensation surging into my left eye, blackening my vision, pain traveling to the top of my head like the worst migraine I'd ever had. I tried to get up, but I was pushed down again. A cold hand pressed against the side of my head. My head was pulled up, turned so that I was facing the ground, then shoved down again violently, and my mouth hit the tree root. I tasted blood and felt my front teeth break. The pain was everything. A knee was placed on my back, right in the center of my spine, and while it was placed gently, the weight of it kept me pinned in place. I spat out blood and struggled to breathe as my face was pressed down into dirt. Then I felt breath, frigid against my ear. I shivered and began to cry. Don't kill me. I began sobbing. You told. The voice spoke into my ear. It was whispering, but full of anger. You told, but they can't help you here. Jenna took me to the hospital after I dragged my broken body back to the car and drove myself home. Three stitches above my eyebrow, four on my cheek, two on my upper lip. An ER dentist was called in to extract what was left of my front teeth and stitch up my gums. I would need implants or a bridge but my mouth would have to heal first. For now, I would have to live with a broken smile. If I ever smiled again. I told the police I had been mugged. No, I didn't get a look at my assailant. No, I have no idea why he didn't take anything. Jenna and I walked into the house, silently. I had an ice pack pressed up against my mouth. Sometimes, I placed it on my eye, Sometimes my cheek. She walked ahead of me into the kitchen and dropped her keys on the table, right beside a copy of one of my high school yearbooks. 2022. My senior year. What's that? I said. Except because of my swollen lips and missing teeth, it came out muffled. It was here on the table when I got up this morning, she said. I assumed you put it there. Her last statement was a question full of concern. I shook my head feebly. Ryan, what's going on? I feel like you're not telling me something. She chuckled morosely. I feel like you're not telling me anything. I looked at her, then dropped my gaze. I didn't know where to start. And who is Nancy? She asked. Before I could respond, she reached and flipped open the yearbook. It landed on a random page. There, scrawled in the margins, filling every available white space in red ink, was the name, Nancy. I stepped toward the page and flipped through it. Every page. Nancy. 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 It was even written across my forehead in my senior picture. I pulled out a chair and slumped down. 
I looked up at Jenna, defeated. She sat down softly beside me. What is it? Ice pack pressed against my lips. I turned a few pages until I found the freshman class. I scanned the rows of juvenile faces until I found him. I pointed with one dirty fingernail at a boy. A boy with white skin and jet black hair. Even though the picture was black and white, his eyes still looked crystal blue and were framed by dark eye makeup. As a freshman, he would have been around 14 or 15 years old, but he looked much younger. 11 or 12, maybe. Evan Michaels? Jenna read, a question in her voice. I nodded. Who is he? She asked. And even though it was very painful to talk, for more reasons than one, I realized. I told her everything. Evan Michaels was a freshman when I was a senior. He was one of those kids who just randomly showed up one day, appeared as if out of thin air, probably on the first day of the school year, but who really knows or cares? All that mattered was that he immediately became the target of ridicule. Even by freshman standards, he was small, puny. His voice was still as high and flute-like as a prepubescent boy, an androgynous trill that was rarely heard, but always mocked. He had dyed his hair black. He frequently wore mascara and painted his nails a glossy black. He was a loner. He barely spoke to anyone. When he walked down the hallway between classes, he folded his shoulders inward in an effort to shrink and kept his head down low, hair hanging over his eyes. He concentrated all of his efforts into being invisible. And so, of course, we singled him out. Actually, I singled him out. My friends just followed my lead. It started with name-calling. He was small, frail, bad at sports, not very masculine, so we'd hang out by the lockers and wait for him to walk by, and we'd call out a name. Nancy. He wouldn't react, but I knew he heard. After a while, that got boring. So we, I, would walk up behind him at the lockers and whisper in his ear to see if I could make him jump. Then... We started doing physical things, poking him, tripping him, at nothing too painful or damaging, not at first. There was an art teacher, Miss Jones, who took him under her wing. He was a gifted artist. Even then I knew it. He could draw in ink like nothing I had ever seen before, and he was really good at photography. Miss Jones recognized this and put him on the yearbook staff. Most of these pictures, I said, flipping through the yearbook, were taken by him. He had his own camera that he'd brought from home, an expensive one with a powerful lens that allowed him to capture an image without having to get close to it. Once he was on yearbook staff, he wore it around his neck every day like a medal. I could see that it gave him more confidence, as well as something now he could hide behind. As he walked around the hallways or hovered around the perimeter at ball games, he seemed more self-assured. So one day, I brought one of my dad's chipping hammers to school and kept it in my pocket until I saw Evan set his camera down for a moment. One of the guys distracted him, and I casually walked over and punched a hole in the lens with the hammer and put it back down. We stood by and watched him pick it up, laughing when he went to take a picture, and saw the damage. He could hear us. He looked heartbroken. Oh, Ryan. Jenna sighed. We looked over his shoulder covertly until we figured out his locker combinations. His school locker and his gym locker. One time, we took out one of his report folders and replaced all the pages with papers that just said Nancy all over them. He turned it in without looking 
and the teacher was not amused. I wasn't there to see it, but the other freshmen said Evan turned beet red, but refused to give an explanation. Then, one time, three of us went into the locker room after freshman gym class. Evan took longer showers than the other boys. It was just one of his quirks. I don't think he liked to be dirty. We made the other freshmen leave, and then we took Evan's clothes out of his locker and removed all the towels while he was still showering. We shut off the lights and ran. He screamed from the doorway of the locker room until a janitor heard him. And then there was the time I stole a frog from the science lab. Ryan, stop. Jenna said. She had tears in her eyes. She shook her head. Why did he take it? Why didn't he tell? Why didn't one of the other students tell me? I explained to her the strange dynamic in our school. Jocks, like me, especially senior jocks, were idolized by both the other students and the teachers. Our school had a reputation for athletic achievement going back for generations. That reputation was sacred. The athletes were almost untouchable. Some of the teachers knew what we were doing to Evan. Some of it, anyway. Not all of it. And they chose to look the other way. They didn't like him much either. They probably thought the experience would man him up. And we easily indoctrinated the other students. Anyone who told on us would be labeled a tattletale, a squeal. No one likes a tattletale. And the underlying message was that anyone who tattled would become the next object of our attention. Evan, though, was a bit of a mystery. He didn't tell anyone what was happening. And the longer he stayed quiet, the more I wanted to punish him. I wanted to find a line where he couldn't take it anymore. And one day... I found that line. The night before, we had lost a game. A big game. I had blown it. So the next morning, I found myself full of rage. The kind of inexplicable and all-consuming anger only known by teenage boys. I was six feet of muscle and fury in search of an outlet. I walked out of class that morning without even bothering to ask for a pass. When I went into the bathroom, Evan was there. It was like fate. He looked horrified when he saw me, but I just smiled. I had found my outlet. I kicked him into one of the stalls and shoved his face into the toilet. I held him there. It was like I could feel all of my rage coursing down the arm that was holding his head under the water. The release was sweetening. He struggled at first, but he couldn't move me. I don't know how long I might have held him there, if one of my buddies hadn't walked in. He grabbed me by the collar and pulled me off, told me to stop, considered me with a look of shock and disbelief. What? I demanded, straightening my collar. You could have killed him, man. He responded. I wasn't going to kill him. I scoffed, but I could tell from my friend's face that he didn't believe me. That was okay. I didn't really believe myself at that moment. This time, Evan told me, it might have come down to a matter of his word against mine, but my buddy ended up corroborating Evan's story. I'm not sure why. Maybe because he felt guilty for the part he had played in torturing Evan all year. Or maybe because he was truly horrified by what he had seen me doing. Once the bathroom incident was revealed, the entire litany of what I had done to Evan was shared as well. It was only one week before graduation. The principal was as lenient as he could be. I wasn't expelled, but instead suspended for the remainder of the school year. It's the same thing, I had bellowed at him. He remained calm and unwavering. I would receive my diploma, but I wouldn't be allowed to walk with my classmates and I was under no circumstances to ever talk to or approach Evan Michaels again. But I knew. School grounds was one thing, 
but the principal had no authority outside of that building. And so, one day the following week, I followed Evan home from school. When I was finished talking, Jenna looked at me with sadness. She shook her head. The look she gave me was one I had never seen before. It was as if her perception of me was, if not completely shattered, fractured in several places. There was still love there, but also deep disappointment. Oh, Ryan, she said, reaching across the table to take my hand, but then withdrawing it. You were a bully. It was twenty years ago, I argued weakly. I was just a kid. I mostly thought it was funny, and I guess in some strange way I thought that he deserved it. No kid deserves what you did. She countered. I know, I said, pressing the ice pack against my throbbing cheek. I know that now. He was easy enough to find. First, I looked for him on Facebook. He had a barely used profile page. It consisted only of a single picture, but it wasn't of him. It was a black and white photograph of a landscape, stunning and beautiful, artistic, mesmerizing. I found him in the white pages. He was still local. I was surprised that in twenty years we hadn't ever crossed paths, at least not as far as I knew. The neighborhood was quiet. His house was small but well kept, the tiny lawn a lush green. I parked the car by the curb. Jenna had come with me, but opted to wait in the passenger seats with the window down. As I walked towards the door, I spied a pink tricycle alongside a child's bike, cherry red, lying on its side in the grass. I hesitated, then knocked swiftly. My heart was pounding. The door opened, and I looked up. There he was. He was taller than me by a couple of inches. Dressed in a light gray sweater and dark denim jeans, his frame was slender but fit. He was four years younger than me, but could easily pass for a late twenty. His dark hair was long and wavy, falling casually over his forehead and framing his face. I was struck dumb by the man he had become. I might not have recognized him except for those icy blue eyes that looked back at me. Eyes that had momentarily looked welcoming, but then fell into cold recognition. Evan, I stammered. You might not remember me. I remember you. He interrupted. His voice was deep and smooth. I paused. For a moment, we silently stared at each other. I realized I was fiddling nervously with my fingers and forced myself to stop. I dropped my gaze and stared at my feet. I came here to... I began. I cleared my throat. I, I wanted to apologize to you. I hesitantly looked at him, up at him. His expression didn't change. It was emotionless. I couldn't tell if he was angry or simply indifferent. For... Uh, for everything. Suddenly, I couldn't find any more words. I considered listing off every offense that I had come to regret, but there was no point. We both already knew them perfectly well. After a moment, Evan let out a quiet, bitter chuckle, and smiled. The smile was broad, but didn't reach his eyes. It occurred to me that I had never seen him smile before. Not once. And even though the smile was one of incredulity, it made him even more handsome. His teeth were white and perfect. Teeth, I remembered, that were not at all natural. I suddenly felt incredibly self-conscious of my own appearance. 
My swollen, stitched-up face colored by bruises and abrasions, small band-aids failing to fully cover the worst of it. My puffy lips and missing teeth. The way my words were lisped and slurred when I spoke. What is this? Evan said. Are you having some sort of get-right-with-God moment, Ryan? He didn't just say my name. He stabbed me with it. After twenty years, you want to just show up at my house, say sorry, and make nice. Is that what you think's going to happen? I turned and looked back at Jenna, still seated in the passenger seat of the car. She was watching us, but too far away to hear. It's just that, I mumbled, something happened, it has been happening. I see that, he said. His eyes wandered over my face. Looks like someone decided to give you a taste of your own medicine. I met his eyes. Do you know anything about... I started to ask, but his expression remained set, calm. There was no spark of recognition there. Nothing that said Evan had anything at all to do with the events of the past week. Never mind, I said. I just wanted to apologize. What I did to you back then was terrible, inexcusable, and I'm truly, deeply sorry. Please... Forgive me. Evan regarded me for a moment, took a deep, steady breath. His features softened ever so slightly. I looked up at him, eyes pleading, feeling like a helpless beggar. He pursed his lips and looked skyward, thinking. And then quietly, he said, No. My mouth fell open, slowly. A coldness washed over me. No, Ryan, he said. I do not forgive you. And do you know why? Because twenty years ago, I had to endure almost daily torture from you. Abuse, both physical and verbal, and the constant fear of what might be coming next. The embarrassment of being hassled in front of the kids, the loneliness of having no one come to my defense, and feeling so ashamed of being so incredibly disliked that I felt like I had to hide everything from my parents and acted like everything was just fine. And it doesn't end there, he continued. You left me with the memories. I can't say I think of you every day, Ryan, but I think about you often enough. Most of the scars might be invisible, but they're still there. And there's nothing you can do or say to take them away. I've carried them for twenty years, and I'll continue to carry them for the rest of my life. So, no. He shook his head. I won't forgive you. But I am ever so glad you came by today. Because whatever it is that's finally pricking your conscience... Whatever it is that's now haunting you. My heart skipped a beat. I'm glad, he said. I hope you carry that for the rest of your life. A little girl appeared behind Evan, wrapping her arms around his left leg. Daddy, she said. She looked up at me, and her eyes widened. Daddy, who's that? She asked. Evan casually stroked her dark hair, which looked as smooth as silk. He's nobody, he answered, his eyes never leaving mine. I turned away from him and shambled down the sidewalk, head down. I fought back tears. The effort made my eyes and cheek throb. I was halfway down the walk when Evan called out to me, startling me. I stopped moving, but didn't turn to look at him. Even if I did forgive you, Ryan, he said, you wouldn't be done. I wasn't the only one, remember? 
I heard his front door close. Looking up, my gaze crossed the distance between me, standing on Evan's sidewalk, and the car parked by the curb. There, Jenna waited for me, the look on her face one of tired hope. And in the back seat, I saw three children, faces pale, eyes glaring at me with anger, lips curled up in malevolent smiles. They were pointing at me and laughing. I shuffled to the car, got in, started the engine, and sighed. How did it go? Jenna asked. We drove home.